What are we going to find if we fill up this jar with water from this lake? Let's find out. I've got a challenge for you. I want your best guess as to how many different species of animals and tiny creatures are visible in this jar. Take a few seconds to formulate a guess in your mind, or even better, put it down in the comment section and I will heart your comment if you're within three of the correct answer. No cheating. What's the correct answer? Well, stay tuned. We're gonna count these together. We're gonna learn something together today. My intent is to turn this jar into a closed, self-sufficient ecosystem. I source the contents of this ecosystem, this five liter jar, with water, of course, plants, mud, and tiny animals from a freshwater estuary. This small pseudo lake is connected to and part of the St. Louis River estuary, a relatively large freshwater estuary system that flows into Lake Superior and is a crucial habitat to a diverse range of animals. You've already seen what the water looks like after almost a full week of settling, but making a closed ecosystem such as this involves a considerable amount of waiting, and most of that time is waiting for the water to clear up. Immediately after I put it together, the water was much too cloudy, uh, but by day two, you, we can see that it's getting a little clearer and we can start to get a better view of its inhabitants. So, like I mentioned before, let's start counting the number of species in this jar. Maybe the most obvious inhabitant is the pair of ram's horn snails. These snails, each about oh, three quarters of an inch or around two centimeters in diameter, are fairly large for this ecosystem. And I would really hesitate before adding any other such snails of this size to a jar of this volume. Too much biomass uh, in the form of, of large creatures and large species can exceed the capabilities of plants, algae, and other organisms' ability to counter their relatively large appetite for nutrients and oxygen. Now, these were not the largest snails I found at this lake. Here's a shot of a shell of a another much larger snail. Next stop, uh, species number two, are these small, almost worm-like creatures that are clinging to the glass. They're red in color, and that's led to them being often given the name of blood worms. But I'm fairly certain that they're not worms. They're actually the larva of the midge fly. We can also begin to see some of the much smaller creatures that also are near the glass. This round, nearly microscopic creature is called a Daphnia or Cyclops, which are also commonly referred to as water fleas. They vary in size with some barely visible to the naked eye, whereas other times I'll, I'll mistake one for a small beetle or, or snail until zooming in to find it's only another Daphnia. Swimming near the glass is this small, mostly black creature, and it's hard to get a good clear shot of it because of its size and, and near constant movement. Any guesses on what it is? I believe this is a very small leech. Many of us have experienced or witnessed leeches latching onto people's skin and sucking their blood, but many leeches don't subsist solely off of blood, and I'm hoping that this one will do all right in this jar. Over here, we have an aptly named back swimmer. It looks as though it is hunting some of the tiny invertebrates inside. Look at those bright red eyes. And finally, on the second day, there's a small, almost translucent insect. At its current size, I'll be honest, I'm not certain what type of bug this is, but maybe we'll see more of it in subsequent days. In any event, the species count already for the end of the second day is six. Day three and several new species are visible. Near the glass is this nearly transparent worm, likely a type of a flatworm or planarium. It's difficult to see against the still sort of cloudy water. Next we have this thing. I, I'm pretty sure it's an ostracod. There's quite a few of these swimming about. Along with Daphne and copepods, which we haven't seen yet, the ostracods make up the prey species for many of the larger creatures inside, such as the back swimmer that we saw on day two. Here, 
a uh, different snail species is now present joining the ram's horn snail my gut tells me this is a bladder snail but here's another similar looking snail and i'm wondering if one of these is actually maybe a small mystery snail and the other is a, a, a bladder snail they're called uh, bladder snails because their eggs are often laid in the bladders of fish and amphibians before hatching a few weeks later no, actually, I just made that up. But it sounded cool, didn't it? Uh, they're called bladder snails because they have an air bladder of sorts that they can inflate or deflate, allowing them to float or sink rapidly, sort of like a submarine in its ballast. In any event, we'll count that as two new species of snails. And what's this? While I was checking out the snail, this black creature with what looks like white stripes or spots came to see what was going on. I think this is another leech, probably a different species than the other. And swimming in the opposite direction is a green something. It looks like a like a new planarium species of, of some sort. And before we move on to the fourth day, uh, some of you might be asking why I'm making this video. In part, it's because I wanted to and it's interesting to me. And in part, it's because I want to help build an awareness and an appreciation for the awesome world that's been created around us. But when I'm done filming this video, I'm not dumping this jar back into the lake. No, I'm turning this jar into a closed ecosystem. I plan to seal this jar, making it a self-sufficient habitat for the creatures inside. It's a cool habitat that I encourage you to research, and I encourage each of you to try it on your own. But back to the species count, we're now on day four. The water is getting much clearer, the plants are much more visible, and activity inside is much more evident but i will add filming at this point was starting to get really freaking difficult a, a good example is the first species of the day the 13th species on our list this little beetle which i believe is a crawling water beetle was one that i had spotted on previous days but had been unable to capture on video because of the cloudiness uh, and and how much it moves and it moves a lot, darting around the jar from side to side and plant to plant. Here, if you look closely, you can actually see it just narrowly missing a meal in the form of a tiny, uh, I think, ostracod, Daphnia. Likewise, this small creature here, known as an amphipod, was also really frustrating to try and get a good shot of because, just like the crawling water beetle, it rarely sat still in a good position for a shot. This one looked like it was cleaning this plant of the substrate and detritus that had settled on it. Also, I found that the more I filmed, the more I was being bombarded with new species that I hadn't spotted yet. Here, near the water line, is what I believe is the carcass of a giant water bug, although this one doesn't look very giant, so I could be wrong. It looks pretty dead, so I won't add it to the species count. But nearby, we can see this small globular creature, which I also don't think is a new species. I believe this to be an ostracod, which we spotted on day three. Also in this shot is our friend, the planarium. Hey, if I'm your friend, then how come you trap me in this jar? <laughs> All right, that's enough questions out of you, Mr. Planarium. Any more, and, and we'll see how much screen time you get in the next video. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm sure you all know how disrespectful Planarium can get when they reach their teenage years. Moving on, uh, also, also in this shot, in the top left corner is a springtail. I, I had wondered if any of those had made it into this jar, and evidently they had. Springtails are usually a terrestrial insect, but some species thrive on the surface of aquatic environments, walking along the surface of the water and hanging out on plant leaves and stems. And in the opposite corner is what appears to be a, a mite of some sort. So that's species number 16. This is maybe my favorite shot in this whole video, mostly because it was so unexpected. First, we have this small worm-like species I'm not sure what it is, and I'm not even going to uh, take a guess. But that's number 17. But wait a second. Freeze frame. Can, can you spot it? This green thing right here. Not a plant. 
It's a hydra. Hydra are some really cool creatures. They can use their tentacles to engulf prey, can regenerate limbs, and actually scientists are learning and, and guessing that they might also be immune to death from old age. Finding this hydra was so unexpected, but so was this. Check out this, this strange creature clinging to the glass. I thought it was a snail at first until I looked closer, and it's actually what I believe to be a small mussel. I'm not sure on the species. I know zebra mussels, which are an invasive species, litter the waterways of the upper Midwest, including where I was getting this jar. And many of the plants that I pulled from the water, I threw back in the water because they were covered in mussels. So that would be my first guess. I'd always wondered how mussels navigate. I had assumed they just let the water take them wherever it was flowing or else latched on to, you know, boats or, you know, other animals to, to get from one point to another and, and, you know, colonize new waterways. But evidently that's not their only form of transportation, as you can see. And, and finally, for the last species of the day, we have a copepod. These are all over the place in this jar, but kind of difficult to get a good shot of sometimes. They move a lot and, you know, as you can see, they're, they're pretty small. Let's fast forward a bit to day six of this jar's life. I've been opening the jar periodically and I'll probably continue to do so for another few weeks. I know I said this is a closed ecosystem. The reason I'm doing that is to, to allow the organisms inside a chance to adjust, to allow for air circulation, especially since the plants might not be up to the task yet of you know, recycling all, the, all that carbon dioxide and creating all the oxygen that the inhabitants inside uh, require and, and get rid of any excess gases from anaerobic decomposition, which can be deadly early on. In a few weeks though, I, I do plan to keep it sealed for good. Finding new species in this jar is becoming more difficult. Here's a small one. I think it's a larva of some sorts. It, it almost moves like a mosquito larva, but I don't think that's it. Here's the, the larva that we saw earlier in the week in much better contrast by now. I think I cannot confidently say that this is a mayfly larva. This one on the other hand, which I don't think I had spotted until today, I'm not so sure. Possibly a dragonfly larva. Either way, it looks ferocious and I might uh, take it out soon along with the may mayfly larva if, you know, if they continue to grow. I think it's a good thing to have predators inside of a jar such as this to balance out the ecosystem. But if one or two predators crowds out the rest of the space, well, that's not great for long-term growth. The snails wasted no time in laying a grouping of eggs, as you can see here. Looks like we're gonna have a, a snail party in here pretty soon. Here's the back swimmer again. This is a bit of a blurry shot, but inside in the middle of this shot is the crawling water beetle that we saw earlier. And it looks like it's eating or working on killing prey of some sort. It's pretty gruesome. But with the water much clearer and, and me not really finding anything new, I think that's it, 22 species. Is that as much as you expected? I challenge you to, to look back at the shots in this video. Maybe you can find something that I missed. I know there's a few that I almost did, such as that green planarium or the mite. It's easy to fixate on the main focus of a, of a shot and miss something in the periphery. Now we sit back and watch as this... Do, do you hear that? Where's that? Oh no, not in another jar. Hey, wait till I'm done filming. Thanks, folks. That's number 23, the tube effects, aka boogie worm, jamming out to their favorite club music. But hang on a second. So if I'm closing this jar indefinitely, how does it change over time? And you know, hypothetically, what if I opened it in, let's say, a year's time? What would it look like? What would it smell like? Want to find out? Here's a sneak peek from a video where I did just that. All right, let's open this thing up. Whoa, that was not what I was expecting. Click the video on the screen if you wanna see me open a jar, 
just like the one I made today after it's been sealed for a whole year. I'll see you all next time.